Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's a nice crowd. So I'm going to go through today kind of the journey of my life through the focus of creativity, innovation, and challenging convention. And I think you'll see that every step of the way through my life at this point, those fundamentals have come up and impacted not only my life, but the lives of many people around me in a very positive and significant way. So I'm not going to go too far back in my history, but basically I grew up in a restaurant. My mother and father owned a restaurant since I was five years old. My grandmother owned a restaurant. It's very much in my family. Went to culinary school and worked at the French Laundry in Napa, California, which is still to this day uh, known as one of the best restaurants in the world. Found an amazing mentor, Thomas Keller, took me under his wing and moved here to the Chicago area to try to run my own show. Was at Trio for four years up in Evanston. Finally found a partner that could help me realize my dream, my lifelong dream of owning my own restaurant. And we decided to take the leap of faith and open Alinea in 2005. Excuse me, 2005. What is a restaurant? We had to ask ourselves in the beginning. <laughs> Basically, the way we approach everything is asking the question, what is? So when you look at restaurants, they run the gamut. Conveyor sushi, fast food, the Jetsons, you know, diners, which I grew up in. But then they also fulfill a certain aspect, a certain reference point in society. Is it a business lunch? Is it a family gathering? Is it a romantic evening? So why a restaurant? What does a restaurant do? When we opened the linea, we are asking ourselves all these questions. And I said, I wanted the restaurant to feel like my home. As much as I possibly could, I wanted you to feel like you were eating in somebody's living room and being taken care of. So the scale of the space that we sought out was very small. Instead of one giant room with chandeliers, we were looking for more of a residential scale, something where you could focus on the food and feel like you could have a conversation with the person next to you without being eavesdropped on while you were eating this amazing meal. So as we went through the process of creating Alinea, we said, OK, if we're going to have a small scale restaurant that does long tasting menus, 22 courses long, telling a story about maybe my life, maybe the cook's life, maybe your life. If we can evoke emotion from the dining experience and make you feel a certain way, if we can pull on these emotional triggers, then we have something that's new. But back to the restaurant design, I said, I want a dining room table that feels like my dining room table at home. I want it to be wood. Because when you think about draping a table in a typical restaurant, why do they drape the table? Because typically, it's a crappy table underneath. <laughs> They're hiding the table. Let's make beautiful furniture. Let's make it sturdy. Let's make it elegant. Let's give it a tactile feel. Well, then where do you put the silverware? You can't put silverware down on a bare table. Health department won't let you. So now we have to design something to put the silverware on. So a table on a table. What happens when you put water down, water glasses down on a bare wood table in summer in Chicago? Condensation. So now we have water dripping all over your wood table. That's another great function of a tablecloth. It soaks up the water. So how do we do that? Well, we get on Google, right? And we Google the dew point of water. And we figure out what temperature we have to hold our water in in our refrigerator so that when we pour it, based on the certain humidity that we have in the dining room and the temperature, 
it won't condensate in the glass instead of using a bulky coaster. When you go into most restaurants, there's a centerpiece at the middle of the table. Usually it's flowers, right? And you say, I don't like roses. I like calla lilies. Or even worse, what is the point of a flower that doesn't smell? There's no flowers that smell anymore. You ever notice that? If you get a bouquet of flowers, unless you pick them out of your backyard, they smell like nothing. They've genetically bred the scent right out of flowers. So what's the point of putting it on the table? So we say, well, let's make the centerpiece visually interesting, but functional. So we take, in this case, this is one example of many, small key limes. And we shrink wrap them in plastic that we bought from Uline. They go on the table to form the centerpiece. It immediately evokes conversation amongst the table. People are engaged. What is this crazy thing? Why are they putting it on our table? Where are the flowers? Well, at some point in the meal, the front of the house service team will come over and puncture that lime with a specially made tool. They'll squeeze it so the juice runs out over a dessert course. So what, we've, what have we done there? We've eliminated the excess. $70,000, $75,000 a year from the florist to cover the table with flowers that mean nothing and have no function to something that immediately engages conversation, makes people talk, and later becomes a functional aspect of the meal. Architecturally, we looked at the restaurant and we said, OK, when you're walking into a restaurant, typically this is what you find. Welcome to Shma Shma Shma. Can I have your last name? Right? <laughs> They're behind a podium. There's a physical barrier. It's not warm. They don't know who you are. And one of the worst parts in a big restaurant or a busy restaurant is if the Smith party walks in with the Johnson party because they got out of the cab at the same time. So now as the host or hostess, I have all these people coming at me and I've completely lost control. You can't greet them in a personal way. So we said, OK, what's the solution? Make a really, really narrow hallway so that they have to walk single file. They have to walk in the door one at a time. And so now we can greet people in a very personal manner. What you can't see, or maybe you can see on the left there, there is an opening that two sliding doors whisk open like Star Trek based on an infrared sensor in the hallway. So as you're walking down, it's like a fun factory. You have no idea where you're going. You don't even know if you're in the right spot. But all of a sudden, the doors swish open. And the sensor is also triggering a light inside the restaurant, alerting the host and hostess that somebody's in the hallway approaching the door. So instead of behind the podium, they walk up to the front door, and they're able to greet you person to person, shake your hand, take your coat immediately, Deal with the name and all the other jazz later, because now you're dealing with one person. The food. So we started looking at the food when I was at Trio in 2001, and I was like, all right, as with most industries, everything is on this roller coaster bell curve pattern, right? You think about anything, any technology, any arts, cooking, everything, swings in about a 15-year cycle, 20, maybe 25. But the point is, when I was coming out of culinary school and working for Charlie Trotter and working for Thomas Keller, I was in the crescendo of that arc of contemporary cooking in America. And basically, that meant taking French technique and Asian minimalism and blending it with American ingenuity to make contemporary American food. Well, I didn't want to do that anymore. I was bored. And I thought there should be a rebirth in cooking and in cuisine and gastronomy. So we started coming up with new ways of creating texture, new ways of presenting food. We partnered with a designer called Martin Kastner, because the techniques that we were coming up with in gastronomy 
we're rendering the service pieces that were available to us useless. So for 300 years, we've been eating off plates and bowls with forks and spoons and knives. But now, all of a sudden, the cuisine takes a rapid leap forward, and all of these things are useless. Here's a good example. It's a toothpick. You pick up the lozenge with a stainless steel toothpick, you pop it in your mouth, it melts. Why not use vegetables as service pieces? That's a piece of lemongrass. Transparency of raspberry, something as fragile as glass, smells like raspberries, dissolves in your mouth. An item that transports something very, very cold to the dining room, that's about the size of a quarter, preventing it from melting in its transportation to you, which takes about three and a half minutes. The antenna, this one's fun. Inkwell, aromas. So here, in the, in the small container below, you see the flame coming out of it. Growing up in, in Michigan, in the fall, right around this time of year, right around Halloween, everybody would rake the fallen leaves that had, had come off the oak trees in their front yard out to the street. You would jump in them. The bully on the street would shove them down your shirt. <laughs> and then ultimately, back in 1985, you would light them on fire. Now, that's not very eco-friendly anymore, and we don't do that. But to me, the smell of burning oak leaves means Halloween in the Midwest. And I said, I want to capture that smell, that quintessential smell of fall, and present it to you when you dine in the restaurant, because it's not a seasonal ingredient. It's not pumpkin. It's not orchard apples. It's not Brussels sprouts. It's not chestnuts. It's the smell of fall. So in that burning container is oak leaves. We snuff it out with another container. The leaves begin to smolder. We take a glass, we turn it upside down, we capture the smoke, and then we place that glass over top the food. When it comes out to the dining room, the glass is lifted, the smoke is released, and instantly you're transported back to when you were 12 years old. So we're talking about emotional cooking. We're talking about changing, there's another example of the burning oak leaves, changing the way that you perceive not only cooking and food, but what food and dining can be through an emotionally enriched experience. More examples of some of the service pieces that Martin and I collaborated on. And it really becomes a point of, like I was saying before, challenging the convention. Why I have to serve something on a plate? This is inspired by, so this is, this is a fun example. It's a parchment envelope. And inside is all these dried food components. Growing up as a kid, the best part of the Doritos is that two tablespoons of crumb at the bottom and you take the bag and go like that. Well, we were recreating that experience. So now, literally, you just dump that in your mouth and it's one single shot. This is a fun one, the tripod. So I tell Martin, I'm like, Martin, I want to create a hibiscus lollipop. I need you to figure out a way to serve it. And instead of doing what everybody else would do, what is normal, freezing the lollipop, securing the lollipop to a single stick, he came to me with this idea he calls a tripod. Goes down on the table like this. The guest grabs it. The three legs collapse into a single stick. And then you eat it. This is the way we're thinking about restaurants, about food. Let me get to uh, some more examples of some of the wacky stuff that we do here. The antenna, let me go back to this. That wire suspends a bite of food 14 inches off the table surface. You're sitting there, we encourage you to take that bite without your hands. Lean forward, take the bite off the wire. Now, it may, what did you all do? You laughed. That's the point. People laugh, people are intimidated. We've had people go like this and push it away. I won't do that. I find that OK. If you choose not to eat that bite because you're intimidated, then I've achieved something with food and dining that you typically cannot. And that's what we're chasing, the emotional experience. 
All right, let me skip ahead here. So 2006, Gourmet Magazine, when it was still in business, Condé Nast killed it, I think, a year and a half ago, which is very unfortunate. But Gourmet, every five years, comes out with the top 50 restaurants uh, in the country. And we were number one. We had been open a year and a half. We were very surprised and very happy. We said, it's time to make a cookbook, right? Number one restaurant in, in, in the country, one of the most highly regarded in the world. Let's make a cookbook and show the world what we, what we do. So we went to the publishers, and they said, great. Let's make a cookbook. And take all the recipes that you created at Alinea and make them applicable for the home cook. <laughs> and we said, no, Al. You know, we can't do that. We need to show what we do. This is more of an art book, something that's going to inspire photographers and designers and, and interior designers and graphic designers and business people and everything. And we want to make the recipes a metric. And they said, nobody in America understands how metric works. It has to be in standard. And then we said, we want the pages to be gray with white and black font. And they said, impossible. Nobody can read it. And then we said, we want to have this very atypical photography and layout. And they said, absolutely not. You need to use our photographer with our graphic designer, and we're going to edit it, and you need to get an author. And we said, no chance. If this is what you're going to do, if you're going to control our image as a brand and make us put out a product that we don't feel comfortable with, we're going to do it ourselves. I'm a, I'm a cook. I've never made a book before. My partner is not a publisher. We made a cookbook ourselves. We got our own photographer. We got our own graphic designer. We fronted the money. We partnered with 10 Speed Press for a marketing distribution deal. And the book has sold about 80,000 copies. We own all of the rights. We're able to put it on iPad, which they were scared to death of, so on and so forth. With Next, the restaurant that we just opened in April, we felt it was time to do our second place. And how this came up was, in 2007, I got diagnosed with stage 4 tongue cancer. I metastasized into both sides of my lymph nodes. Doctor said, you're done. Your chance of survival is 30%. But if you want to give it a go, then we recommend taking off your whole mandible, three quarters of your tongue, have a radical neck dissection on your left side, and a minor one on your, on your right side, and hope that you live. We'll give you about a 30% shot. I went to four doctors that told me that exact same prognosis and recommended treatment. And I kept saying to myself, it's 2007. I need to find a doctor, a medical team, that thinks about cancer treatment, head and neck cancer treatment, the same way that I think about food. Outside of the box, challenging convention, saying what is and why. So we went to New York to Sloan Kettering. We went to MD Anderson in Texas. We went to three institutions here in Chicago. They all said the same thing. Finally, luckily, we went for consultation at the University of Chicago. And we walked in the room and the doctor said, what has everybody been telling you? And I told them what I just told you. He shook his head in agreement. He said, yes, you do have stage 4B cancer. Yes, typically your, your chances aren't great, but we have a new protocol that we think can not only save your life, but save your tongue, save your jaw, save your neck. And I said, where do I sign? And he said, well, this is a clinical trial. We don't know if it works. It's only been on the market for about two years. The drug, Herbitux the Martha Stewart got her in trouble drug, was developed for pancreatic cancer, but we're noticing that it's working for head and neck. Would you like to give it a try? 
And I said, yeah. He goes, well, let me warn you, if it doesn't work, the amount of chemotherapy and radiation that we're going to give you in conjunction with the Herbitox is going to make this your one shot. You're going to get 65 treatments of radiation. After that, the tissue, it won't be able to handle radiation again. So I said, if that's my option, then let's go for it. So go through the treatment, and here I am, standing here, talking. So, back to where I started. During that time, when I first got diagnosed, my business partner came into Alinea after driving back seven hours from a golf tournament in Michigan. And uh, he walked in the back door, he looked worse than I did, and I was walking around with stage four cancer. And I said, man, you want something to eat? We were in the middle of dinner service at Alinea. This never happens. I never cook anybody from the outside just walking in the back door. But it was a special day. He said, yeah, I am hungry. I cooked him a very traditionally inspired French duck dish. Morels, peas, demi-glace, fanned out duck breast. He ate it. He said, wow, chef, this is amazing. Why don't we open a French restaurant? Forget, people want to see you cook real food, he said. <laughs> Great. So I said, yeah, you know, I like eating French food. I like cooking French food. But after three months, it would be boring. And he goes, great, then we'll open an Italian restaurant. <laughs> no, after three months, I'll get bored. Well, then we'll open a Thai restaurant. And I said, man, you're out of your mind. Like, now you're opening, now we have five restaurants. And I'm walking around, everybody tells me I'm going to die. What good is that going to do anyone? And he goes, no, no, you don't understand. They're all the same restaurant. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. So now you're telling me that every three months, I need to research a different cuisine. I need to write a menu. I need to train the cooks. I need to document the recipes. I need to train the front of the house. I need to get the sommelier team to pair the beverages with that menu every quarter. And he said, yeah. And I go, that's impossible. And he goes, don't you realize that you just described the linea? And I said, yeah. <laughs> he got me. Now I have to do it. So we did it, and we opened next, and we said, OK, we're going to create a concept that's a new restaurant every three months. And it's going to be based on a geographic place in the world, city, and a date and time. Because those are the two things that frame gastronomy. So then we started talking about it, and he goes, well, what else can we challenge about the restaurant industry? What have we learned from millennia? Well, we've learned that we spend over $100,000 on flowers a year. We've learned that we pay five reservationists $180,000 cumulatively to answer the phone from 9 in the morning until 6 at night and tell people that they cannot come to our business and spend money. That's the dumbest thing in the world. And I said, yeah, yeah, you're right. So all of these things that we identified that were major inefficiencies in our operation we said, we need to eliminate that with Next. He said, hey, what if we sell tickets? Just like Steppenwolf. And I said, that'll never work. You can't do that. Nobody's going to want to pay in advance for a meal. It's one thing to do it for a Broadway show. It's another thing to do it for a Bulls game or a Bruce Springsteen concert. Nobody will do it for dinner. He goes, let's try it. I said, OK, let's try it. He goes, let's do variable pricing. So if you come at an off-peak hour, you're going to get the exact same meal, the exact same experience for $65. If you come Saturday night, 7 o'clock, which is prime time in the reservation that everybody wants, you're going to pay $100. $100 is fair for the meal. $65 is a discount. That way, the restaurant will always be full. People will come Wednesday at 9.30 at night. I said, OK, let's give it a try. Let's make people pay in advance. Let's not have anybody answer the phone. Let's do it all web-based. Great. Does that software exist? No. OK. <laughs> Let's build it. So we go out. We hire a college student to build the software from scratch. 
We pay the guy $15,000, which for him was great. He gets a little bit of the backside. So now we have Groupon coming to us. We have all of these larger companies saying, hey, hearing about this software thing in Wall Street Journal, think about selling that? So now, by taking that risk, challenging the convention, pushing beyond, it's a happy ending. We own the software, the reservation's full, the restaurant's full every night, the software is going relatively glitch-free now. We had a couple issues <laughs> right off the bat. Um, and the most important thing, people aren't complaining. People are paying in advance. Richard Melman was quoted in the Tribune when they heard that we were going to go to tickets and said, smart idea, eliminates a lot of problems in the restaurant industry, wish we could do it, but we won't take that risk. Danny Meyer, very famous New York restaurateur, Gramercy Tavern, 11 Madison Park, Shake Shack, you name it was quoted saying the same thing in the New York Times. So it's about taking risk for us. And sometimes you fail. We've had plenty of failures, but we've had way more successes, including the cancer battle, including Next in the aviary, including Alinea, that failing every once in a while is OK. Nick said to me one time when we were opening Alinea, it was 8 in the morning, we were going to the construction site, and I go, man, I feel nauseous. I'm nervous as heck. And he goes, if you wake up every morning without a little bit of nausea, that means you're not trying hard enough. If you wake up and you start puking, you probably tried a little too hard. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, do we have any questions? There's not a lot of sleep. Um, the original idea, one of the original ideas with Next is that if we were doing, so our first menu was Paris, 1906. And I was like, OK, I'll fly to Paris for a week. How romantic will this be? I'll fly to Paris. I'll assimilate the cuisine, the culture, everything that surrounds and frames gastronomy. I'll come back. I'll write a menu. I'll explain it to the staff. And then when we do Thai, I'll fly to Thailand. It doesn't work like that. Um, it's a lot of web-based research, it's a lot of cookbooks, it's a lot of blog uh, research, it's a lot of connecting with special purveyors and people. It's about delegating, which I was never very good at. At Alinea, I was always very hands-on. Felt like I had to touch everything with Next and the aviary opening. We went from 55 employees to like 165 or so in a matter of like flip of a switch. Um, for a restaurant, for a small restaurant, that's a lot. Uh, so we had to start delegating and get a little bit more structured. Yeah. But the other interesting thing with, with the concept of the restaurant, two, two interesting things that it lends itself to that we thought about in the very beginning is one TV. So I don't know if you're familiar with shows like No Reservations where Anthony Bourdain is free to travel the world and talk about cuisine and all this. The show lends itself naturally to that, right? So if we're doing Paris, we've, they film us in Paris or researching Paris, and then we execute Paris, and there's a payoff at the end. The curtains go up, the restaurant opens, they show somebody like dropping a plate, and then there's smiles, and everybody applauds, and it's over. And then we go to Thailand, and then we go to Vietnam, and then we, go to, we do a menu called New York Circa Mad Men era. It's endless. Conceptually, it's endless, and it's always about moving forward for us. The other thing it, it, we have in the works that'll come out in three weeks is uh, ebook. So again, another concept where we frame Paris 1906, condense it all in-house. Apple has partnered with us to code it and market it. So it'll be on the iPad in three weeks. They have all the material that we produce in-house. And now we're currently doing our second menu, which is Thailand. So every quarter, we'll release a, a next ebook, And then at the end of the year, if we feel like we want to because we own the material, we either shop that to a publisher 
and bind the book in hard copy, or we do it ourselves again. So these are all things that synergize really well with the concept going forward. Any more questions? Um, you shared with us a lot of the conventions that you challenged and how they worked. Share with us a couple that didn't. OK. I'm glad you brought that up. I knew somebody would. Um, so what is a restaurant? Does a restaurant have to have tables? We tried that once. <laughs> so you see these honeycomb-shaped things hanging on the wall. Well, there's food inside, and people are walking around, and they puncture through the parchment, grab the bite of food, and eat it. This works really well for a cocktail setting where the food is on the perimeter of the space, and everybody's walking around with this drink, and it's very interactive. It's fun. Could it be a restaurant? Probably not. What about this one? We're very, very focused on color and cooking. So if you watch the guy holding the tray in relationship to the food, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with Peter Greenway, the director, but he plays with a lot of color in his cinematography. So watch. It changes the feel of the food. It changes the mood. So now we ask ourselves, can we have front of the house team members run in the back, change a different color coat to deliver you a specific course? There's been a lot of scientific studies that say, if you see red, that tomato tastes riper. Something we're playing with. We haven't figured out how to make it work because you look like a clown. <laughs> when you come out in a red blazer, it's a little strange. Um, so what about this idea of what we call introduction? You're eating a course. You're having your short ribs. Midway through, we do something to make the character of that dish that you're consuming change dramatically. So in this case, you see the, uh, Bradley, one of our captains there that's eating, he's being offered a bite. So he's had three bites of the plate in front of him. He's offered something that radically changes the flavor on his palate and makes the duration of the course now taste different. Or we just light it on fire. <laughs> um, think about if you're eating sushi, right? You have three bites of sushi, and then somebody comes by with a heat source and turns it into sautéed fish. Same plate. This one we actually did implement. This one actually did work. This was when it was a concept phase where we were like, why do we have to serve food on plates? Why not put the food directly on the table and let people eat off it? What if those macaroons right there were out of reach of Amanda, and she really wanted one? Now she has to ask somebody to pass her a macaroon. Well, what if the food was directly on there, and you had to get up from your table, walk around, take a spoonful, or ask somebody to give you a piece? So we were trying to figure that we need a giant plate. We need a plate that covers the entire table is what we were thinking. Well, that's impossible. How are you going to wash it? There's no dish machine big enough. It's heavy. You're going to be hitting people in the head when you're walking through the dining room. The answer was right in front of us the entire time, but we didn't see it. Silicone tablecloth, food, food safe, heat resistant, cold resistant, can wash it easily. So you roll out the tablecloth on the table, two chefs come out, they dress the table, they sauce on it, they put the proteins down, they walk away, you eat directly off the table. So you're eating a meal, we, try, we haven't successfully done this one, we, you're eating a meal, and what is it like if we ask you to get up from your table? Now, the monotony is immediately broken. You're at this table for three and a half hours, right, at Alinea. All of a sudden, we say, chef would like to see you in the kitchen. Really? Stand up, go to the kitchen. While you're gone, we strip everything off the table, <laughs> and then we fill it back up with all of these unusual aesthetics so that when you come back, we've broken the monotony of the meal. Instead of plate, 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 now you come back, and everything is alive. It's a circus on the table. It's a lot of work, that one. Here's an idea that we've also played with and had fair success with. So you see all these wacky things in the background, but in the front you see a traditional rack of lamb that's been roasted. So at one point in the meal, at Alinea, you have avant-garde cuisine for 12 courses in a row. It would be like listening to the same tone in music. 
right? All of a sudden, there's a dramatic switch where you go from progressive, 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 and then we drop an uber traditional course on the table. How does that make you feel? It jolts you a little bit. You eat the roasted rack of lamb, and then you go back to modern, 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 modern. What is that juxtaposition like? Does it make the old feel older? Does it make the new feel newer? Or does it make you realize that food really hasn't changed in 100 years? This one is my biggest failure. And we've been chasing this for about three years. You come into the restaurant, I give you that card, index card, with those words printed on it. We say to you, pick one word from every column. You choose bitter, chewy, whimsical, and zero degrees Celsius. You turn that card back into the kitchen. Now we have to give you a course based on what you chose. So we would create this, a frozen cranberry gelée that is texturally chewy, an orange peel puree on top that is very bitter. Obviously, I said it was frozen to get the chewy texture. So now we create a service piece that transports it to your table and maintains that zero degrees. And if you think about it, the flavors there are, this happened to be around Thanksgiving. It's cranberry relish with orange, right? There's no turkey in there. But that is sage on the top. Those are some of the successes and failures. But really, it's about, you know, again, I, I, can't, I can't stress it enough. For us, it's about looking at things and just challenging and going, what can't a restaurant do? Now we have to try to do it. And that's it.